All right then. So yesterday we were talking about turbochargers. There we go. We're specifically talking about this system, the Lycoming, Lycoming density slash differential control system. And I believe we left off with, let me see, we we're talking about talking about something, talking about the different different ways it works. I, we had talked about uh, the wastegate and let's see, I said three basic types of wastegates. So there's the fixed type um, and then there is uh, the manually operated. And I went through some stuff about the manually operated. And then what I should have said, or I may have kind of said, is the wastegate can also be oil controlled, can be oil controlled, which is how really almost all of them work can be oil controlled be oil controlled all right so be oil controlled and then we looked at the picture of it and i said i make some notes so it is piston operated piston operated um oil Oil, well, let me see. Let's back up a little bit. What kind of oil? We'll say engine oil. Engine. Engine oil. Pressure. Is fed to a piston. Is fed to a piston. It's, can you guys hear Jay? My gosh, I can't as loud. Uh, engine oil pressure is fed to a piston, and that is at all times, at all times. I thought it was MJ. <laughs> it's a little MJ in there. He's always, not MJ, I'm about MJ, but my son Jay, he is always happy. And he is being happy right now. All right, so engine oil under pressure is fed to the piston of the uh, wastegate at all times, right? So we talked about, let me pull up that wastegate over here. We talked about how the wastegate is over here and engine oil pressure is fed right here at all times into, and it's always gonna flow into this chamber right here. And whether or not it actuates depends upon if we close off the outlet or not, which is all the controllers do. They either drain oil or close off the outlet. And this one right here is draining currently and this one here is blocking off the outlet. So uh, pressure would not build up in here because it's gonna drain out of this one. So if it can drain out of either one, then you have no pressure build up in here. So engine oil pressure is fed to the piston at all times. As oil pressure builds, as oil pressure builds, builds, wastegate is closed. Wastegate is closed. And that is the opposite of a throttle on a, a carburetor. So if, if it's closed, then it's the opposite, then it means um, it's open. So turbo, turbo on. And remember when I say on, off, it's not a light switch. It's varying degrees of off or on. All right, um, and then the opposite when oil pressure is bled off, is bled off, the wastegate opens. Which would be turbo off. Whoa, I just messed that up. Turbo off. Open is off. Kind of like electricity. Closed is on, open is off. Never thought about that before. All right, um, the position of the wastegate, of course, the position, position of the wastegate, of the wastegate, of the wastegate is variable. Meaning, as I said before, it's not necessarily open or just open or just closed, but it can go back and forth. A little bit open, a little bit closed, and acts like a throttle, so to speak. 
Now I did tell you guys this the other day, the wastegate is never fully, wastegate, wastegate is never fully open or fully closed. Never. Um, and the reason why, if, if it was fully closed, if it is fully closed, uh, it could actually stick closed. So uh, it could stick, it could stick closed. And you don't want that. Um, and the reason why is, uh, I don't know how, how is that because of heat it is yeah in my notes um well let's go back to here um back to here fully closed from that slide there we go if it is fully closed that is going to be turbo what on on okay so you think well i want to talk about is fully open a little bit obviously but fully closed um in the, the reading that i had it said well it could actually uh, it could coke. Um, I kind of have a hard time seeing that since oil is over here just because this is closed. Not going to get coking oil over here. So I changed my notes a little bit just to say that it could get stuck. And I think it's a more appropriate response to say, knowing how these things work, is when the butterfly is actually touching over here, uh, it could, you know, because of it, a lot of reasons, expansion, contraction, um, just the metal being there, it could actually stick stick in the closed position. And then you're stuck with the turbo wide open and, and you don't want that. So I'm just gonna change my notes from it. It doesn't necessarily coke. Uh, I'm just gonna say it could stick closed. And I like that a lot better. Um, and then we'll say if it's fully open, if it is fully open, and I don't even love the way this terminology is out of this book, um, but I'm just gonna go with it. A turbine, turbine does not turn, does not rotate, rotate's a better word, and is unevenly heated, and is unevenly heated, heated. Um, this causes stress. and cracking. That is a very bad thing. So we don't want that. Uh, but at the same time, there's a certain amount of, is that really totally true? Because if it's all the way open, and this is in fact an easier path, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get air flowing through here. So I think we can take that and just use use our brain a little bit and know that the turbine should never be standing still once it's operational. So it's got to be moving and the system should be designed in such a way that it will allow it to move. I think that's an even better way to say it. So if you were troubleshooting one of these things and working on it and uh, were able to determine that it wasn't actually rotating while the engine was operating, um, and I suppose the way I would end up doing that if I wanted to do that is right here, this coupling, is real easy to take off. Well, I should say real easy. In aviation terms, it's relatively easy. Uh, and I always, on every single annual or 100 hour inspection, pop this coupling off here and I stick my fingers in here and I flash and I feel around. I feel how it turns and rotates freely, make sure there's no grinding or uh, anything hitting it. And then I inspect the inlet blades and make sure that they're all in good shape. So if I had to, I suppose I could start the engine up if I suspected this wasn't turning at all and watch this rotate, although I don't know why I do that, but I could. No. On newer turbocharged aircraft, do they have electronic wastegates, like electronically controlled? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Sorry, I gotta turn my phone off it keeps it for some reason. Nobody wants to bother me right now. Hey, Kevin? Yeah? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Christian just texted me and said he's locked out of the meeting. Yeah, I, I locked. Okay, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I told you guys, there are a lot of people who are starting to just kind of wander in and then they wander in and then they're not interested. So, 
I will unlock it in a little bit when I get to it. So this causes stress and cracking. So do not want to do that. All right, now let's talk about our systems. Uh, going back to Mark's question, I can see a day when they're going to be very automatic, uh, far more automatic than they are now. Um, I suppose I have to think that through. Then we're talking about electronic systems and how how reliable are they? Uh, you know, it's just it all it takes money and stuff to prove this stuff. And when you have something that works, well, that they tend to stick with it. So and hopefully automatic. the sensors don't fail. <laughs> That's exactly it. Hey Kevin, when when you see in this on an inspection, uh, it is more like. Um, uh, prone to fail the turbine part, right? Than the impeller? Um, because it get hot or, or doesn't No, really matter. because they're one unit, they tend to fail together. And it usually, if, if you can have a problem, you can have a problem inside the bearings. And that's a whole unit problem. So I don't really, they're, I don't really see like, like the turbine side blades having a problem and the inlet side's not. I, I haven't had a problem with any of them. Uh, really, they're, they're pretty robust. But I would imagine given enough time, if I had to place money on what I would see busted first, I would see the intake busted first because of FOD damage. And that's redundant. That's like saying ATM machine. So unless it's foreign, is it foreign object damage, foreign object debris damage, then it's not redundant. Anyway, all right, automatic systems. We're, the one we've been talking about is the light coming. And specifically, here we go. We're um, the light coming. All right. All right. So light coming in general. I see where I'm going with this. Light coming in general um, utilizes U T I L I utilizes the same basic components. Basic components we've been talking about. What are we talking about? The wastegate, the Y, the turbo, the, um, all those components. So, which is to say, well, I can write that, uh, the turbocharger unit. The turbo, when I say turbocharger unit, of course, that includes the compressor and the turbine and all that. We have a wastegate. And it is going to use uh, one, of three systems. Now, keep in mind that Lycoming could do things different than what I'm saying. You're not really limited to this. That's the one thing I'm finding out where they will mix and match some of their parts. All right, um, we have the three types. So one of the types, the first one we talk about is a differential. Differential pressure controller. controller um, and the density, the density controller. Um, there is the variable pressure controller. And the slope controller. All right, so let's talk specifically about the one what we've been talking about, the one I keep bringing up the slides for us. That's the light coming. Light coming differential slash density system. All right, I'll let you guys have a chance to get caught up there.
All right, caught up? How are we doing? All right, moving on then. All right, so what? Nope, everybody's good? Okay. So these are some of the notes I started to write yesterday. I said, wait a minute, let's back up off this. Um, this is the system used on the TIO 540. What does TIO mean? Turbo injected opposed. There we go. Alpha to alpha, which describes the accessory case and, and makeup of the engine used on the Piper Navajo. Piper Navajo. It is sea level boosted. Sea level boosted by 10 inches. So that means we should see about 40 inches of manifold pressure, a fully boosted. It has a critical altitude. Uh, 19,000 feet. What does that mean? No longer boosts above 19,000. Does it no longer boost above that? It drops well, below it, like it sea level. level. Yeah, there you go. That's a better explanation. It starts dropping below sea level. So it's still well boosted above 19. It's just no longer going to give you uh, the sea level pressure at, at that altitude. Um, so it's, I don't know why I have this one. So How would they figure that out? Well, it's easy. You just uh, figure out your horsepower. When you get to 19,000 feet and you start dropping off the horsepower curve, then you know that was critical altitude. So it's, it, well, because it's 310 horsepower. Uh, without, it, without it, it's 290 horsepower without. Without turbo. So you just... Well, I don't just take off and do it. You use a pressure chamber so you can mon monitor everything. But, but uh, you know, if I had a home-built turbocharged engine and I wanted to figure out what my sea level pressure was, if I just figure out some way to figure out my horsepower and uh, just start climbing. And when I got to 19,000 feet and I had a horsepower curve was solid at sea level and then the horsepower started to fall right there, I'd say, well, my critical altitude is 19,000 feet. So, all right, so that's it. So... We're talking about the density controller. So remember, it has two controllers. It has the density controller and the differential controller. So first one we'll talk about is the density controller. Density controller. Um, it is, it's designed to sense the density of air after it passes the compressor. So designed. Designed to sense density. Density of air, oops, air, air, after, after it passes. After it passes the compressor, Um, and before the throttle plate. So after it passes the compressor and before the throttle plate, what does that sound like? Upper deck. There we go, upper deck pressure. Upper deck. So it's designed to, to sense upper deck pressure. Um, I, there are some books that just, they don't say upper, they just say deck pressure. I don't like that. Um, and I guess that's okay because you, I've never really heard anybody talking about lower deck pressure. If somebody even said that, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so we don't really say lower deck. I don't, especially. I say upper deck and manifold. Um, so to that reason, I guess it's, it's okay if somebody wants to say deck pressure, which a lot of books do and a lot of people do. They say deck pressure and then manifold. So I guess upper is kind of a not needed, but hey, I'm going to go. Well, they need to be a lower, right? If you're going to refer to like an upper and lower. I know. Yeah, if you say upper, then where's the lower? Well, we don't yeah. say that. We say manifold pressure because inside the cockpit, you don't have a gauge that says lower deck pressure. You have a 
gauge it says manifold pressure. That's why I go with that. So, so okay. So what is so it's designed to sense the density of air out. Well, it's designed to sense the density of the upper deck pressure. So its job, its job um, is to provide is to provide to provide the quantity. The quantity of air necessary of air necessary necessary for full power operation for full power operation. All right, so let's let's think about that a little bit. So in this particular engine here, where it's sea level boosted by ten inches, so that would be a total of. 40 inches of manifold pressure available. If we have anything less than 40 inches of manifold pressure, we don't have full power because the engine is bait rated at, we'll say 310 horsepower there at 40 inches of manifold pressure, right? At its rated RPM. So there's your 300 horsepower. So the turbo controller does not sense RPM, doesn't know it. Um, it senses strictly this, this density controller is strictly tied into, let me take a look at a picture of it, strictly limited and tied into, and it senses one thing and one thing only, and that is this blue air right here, which is compressor discharge pressure, which is upper deck pressure or deck pressure. So it is only designed to sense one thing, and it, it, is, it is that air. And I'll, notice it's called the density. It's not pressure. It's actually the density. So it, by using an aneroid filled with, a, um, what the heck's it filled with, an inert gas, uh, it's, it's sensing density. And so if you don't have the right density, then it, it is going to shut itself off right here and say, I need the wastegate to close. I need more pressure, need more density. And so that's just what it does. And that's the only thing it's going to be thinking about. And it does not care about anything else. That is its job. So we can say that, oh, well, let me back up a little bit. So that's its thing. But when do I want 40 inches of manifold pressure. Do I want 40 inches of manifold pressure at idle? No. All right. Or a part throttle? No, I would, I would say no. not. That's a little ridiculous. But nobody told the density controller. They forgot. It was not there. It, it logged in late that day because the, it, and it had all kinds of excuses about why the Zoom wasn't working. So it logged in late for that Zoom meeting that day. So it doesn't know. It just knows full, full operation. So because of that, I could say I can make this statement. Only, only designed, only designed to meter, to meter, meter during full power operation. Only designed to meter during full power operation. Um, hey, Kevin. Yeah. What's an aneroid again? Um, it's a thing on your, no, I was going to say that's the thing on your butt. Um, that's something different. So it is, um, it's not TP, right? Yeah. It's, it's a type of robot. No, that's, um, Android. It's, uh, I was going to draw a picture. It's the whole thing. You're just saying that. So I draw a picture. No, I can't draw them. It's the bellows. It's the bellows. Seal bellows. Okay. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. That we saw in the automatic mixture control. It's just that thing, but they're bigger. All right, only designed to meter full power operation. You know, at one point I had in my notes here, it's still here, I didn't write it down. Because um, I was a little, I don't know, not sure how I feel about this statement. Um, but I said, its job is to provide the quantity of air necessary for full operation. Then I wrote, regardless of engine damage. But really, that's, it's something, I don't want to necessarily write it and make it a statement, but it's something to think about. And would that statement be true? And so if I say regardless of engine damage, um, that would mean, what, well, can you guys figure out what kind of damage would result? What are we talking about? An overspeed. Overspeed of what? The, uh, the compressor wheel. Okay, there you go. I like that one. Doesn't know, doesn't care. So that's a good one. Um, I would say I would make that statement is true. Doesn't know, doesn't care. Um, I was also thinking about heat, because if it's ordering uh, 
the proper density, sea level density out of this thing, remember the air is gonna get hotter and hotter. And we said, well, once you reach uh, 500 degrees, you actually have the risk of lighting off the fuel inside the manifold pressure. So um, I don't see anything on here that's got a temperature sensor that says more density, except when we get up to this, uh, this temperature. Um, so I made, made those statements, but you know, I wanna be careful how I say that. Yeah. Uh, if you have a crack in one of your cylinders and you're probably gonna, you know, blew out the cylinder, right? Okay, so, there you go. Doesn't know about that. So it's, it's, uh, it's just trying to take care of that. So, but I'm not gonna write that because I think that's going a little bit overboard, so. All have right. you ever seen that AOPA video of the guy that took off and the cylinder blew off? Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. It. I don't think I've seen the video of it happening, but I saw like the aftermath of it. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, there's a video on YouTube of like he had some sort of cockpit cam or something. And he took off and it blew and he was able to turn around and land. Dang. But does it show the cylinder blowing off? Uh, you, know, you, 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 you just see hear it. You, you hear the the noise, and then he landed. And then when they took it to the mechanic, uh, there it comes a turbo, you know, and everything. And yeah, mm. it's, you have a little crack on on one of the cylinders, and you know the turbo just blew it off. I'm I'm gonna just go out on a little bit of a limit. I don't know, but in my experience, it probably wasn't a little crack it was probably a big crack that had been ignored for a while. And I'm not there and I don't know, but I have seen some cylinders that have been severely cracked. And I think I've told you guys a story about, about one airplane I was annualing and then just made the determination I couldn't even work for the guy because he was willing to let it go. But it was cracked so bad that, uh, well, first of all, you, you just couldn't help but to see it. And then to prove that it was cracked, because the owner wanted to disagree with me that it wasn't really cracked, that it was a, and they all say it's a casting mark. Okay, it's not a casting mark. It runs like that. I, I uh, did a differential compression test on the cylinder and, and put soapy water on the cylinder, and it just blew huge bubbles all over the engine. I mean, they were giant bubbles coming out of these cracks. It was just beyond a doubt. And I was only putting a, you know, uh, no more than 80 PSI into the cylinder, and it was leaking out. So... And the guy had been flying it this way probably for a couple of years. So. People like that should be smacked. I know. <laughs> yeah. And the aircraft placarded that, you know, this pilot is making bad choices. Please don't get in. That's what upsets me is uh, if you want to take your own life into your hands, fine. But these people tend to give other people rides anyway. Um, and that was something that the, the, when I went to Lycoming school, one of the things that just really stuck in me that the instructor said, he said, our engines will always whisper to you before they start screaming. There's always something. It's very, very rare you ever hear about these engines being well-maintained and having a sudden catastrophic failure. It's always this chain reaction of, of things that happened. So I, okay, you, were you doing just an annual on the airplane? I was, yeah. Oh, but it okay. was, uh, it was, uh, I just left the shop I was working at, started it at a new shop. And so I had never seen this aircraft before. And uh, this was the first time I had done the annual on it. And uh, yeah, I found that gigantic crack and that was not good. So, and then the owner and the owner of the company and the owner of the aircraft both argued with me that it wasn't cracked. So I said, well, it is. You can do what you want to with it, but I'm not going to sign it off. So, all right. During, during, during less than full power, less than full power. All right. Because remember, I talked about you have this problem with, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to get into it just a little bit here in my notes um, somewhere, but I'll write it down when we get there. Uh, we have this problem with, with uh, sensitivity. If we have a huge amount of pressure built up on one side of the throttle plate and we barely move it, then you're going to get too much pressure on the other side and you're going to have this problem where you're hunting back and forth uh, and never quite settling down your RPM to where you want it. It makes the engine extremely sensitive, even the smallest of throttle changes. So you don't want that. So we can't just let this density controller have its way all the time and say, you know, well, just give me full power. Uh, if we were going to do that, honestly, it's almost makes more sense just to go with the systems that 
just have a pressure relief valve and that, uh, you know, hold the subject. So, um, so during less than full power operation, what do we do to keep, keep this uh, system kind of in balance, so to say? So during less than full power, uh, we rely on, or what they do on this one, the differential controller. The differential controller will operate the wastegate. Differential controller, controller will operate the wastegate. Now I'm going to go back to my picture just to re-explain that one, one more time for you. So keep in mind that the density controller right here, if its job is saying, hey, I want, and in this case, we said that this was boosted by 10 inches. So if it's saying, hey, I want 40 inches right here, give me 40, 40, I need 40 inches, 40 inches of mercury. And it's continued doing that. And until it gets that, it's going to block off any oil from going in hopes that it backs up the oil pressure here, which drives the uh, piston over to the left and closes off the wastegate and makes the turbo go faster. And until it sees that 40 inches, it's going to do that. Then once it gets 40 inches of mercury, it's gonna release, release this and start bleeding it off until the wastegate starts to open up more. And then it's gonna go a little bit too much the other way. Then it's gonna block it off. And then it's gonna start closing. And then it's gonna get a little too close. And this is gonna open. It's just gonna kind of go back and forth with this little um, hunt and peck back and forth. And that's just what it does. You know, it's kind of moving back and forth. Uh, the, to think that it would actually find a happy place and just stop, it's, it's not gonna happen um, to a point. I mean, a best case scenario, it's gonna get to a point where it's just leaking a little bit of fluid constantly, keeping this right about where it wants. And that's probably more accurate. So it's doing that, but we don't need 40 inches of manifold pressure here because I got the throttle either all the way closed or partly closed and it's just too much. It it's, uh, makes the, the engine too sensitive. So while it's telling that, over here, the differential pressure controller is going to be the brains of this operation. Say, we don't need that. We only need a small split between here. And so it is going to be doing all of the controlling. And so this will never get to 40 inches, even though the density controller keeps begging for it. The differential controller, so we just don't need that. Uh, it's just, it's going to sense the difference between the two and start bleeding off. Oops, and I'll write more about that because that's where we're going next. Uh, so Kevin, in all, all these uh, systems are working like ear is controlling the amount of uh, oil uh, going through these uh, systems, right? That's correct. It's all they're doing is controlling the amount of oil. It's the only thing they can do, these, these particular ones right here. We're gonna look at another one, which has the ability just to pop open and bleed off the blue, but these don't. They're just sensors, sensors, and then control the oil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so where am I here? Um, there we go. Okay. So density. Let's talk about. Uh, oops, I'm still talking about the density. Density controller. So three. It's still talking about density controller. Density. Density is measured by two items. And I bet you know what those two items are. Anybody? The pressure and temperature. Right there. I think I heard it. Let's see. Try one more time. Volume and pressure. Um, well, the volume is is almost the end goal, but it can certainly measure pressure. What about that? Pressure and temperature? Temperature is the one I'm looking for. Pressure and temp. So pressure and temp make up the density. So remember, I go to I take off my air, little airplane over there at McClellan, and uh, they have the automated weather information system. And it, doesn't, it, it tells me the density altitude. So even though McClellan is at what, 74 feet, if it's really hot out, it will say density altitude, 2,000 feet. And that means that it thinks I'm at 2,000 feet. Why? Because number one, the actual barometric pressure, maybe it's a low pressure day. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's 30 inches outside, but maybe the temp is 100 degrees, which brings that density way up. So, all right, so that measured by two items. Um, and those two items, well, it uses, uses a bellows. 
filled with nitrogen. Filled. Wouldn't the temperature bring the density down? Um, yes, yeah, so it brings the density down, but the altitude up. Okay, okay. So uses bellows filled with nitrogen that is in the field with nitrogen. Um, that is in the airstream. So you got that upper deck airstream going right across it. And the bellows can either expand or contract. So the movement, the movement of the bellows will either bleed off oil, will either bleed off oil from wastegate. or block, or block, uh, bleed off. So remember, the, the controller, both the, any of the controllers we've talked about so far, can only do one of two things. Uh, it can either block the oil or bleed the oil off. That's all it can do, block it or bleed it. And if you block it, oil builds up. It's like a dam, builds up behind the dam, presses on the piston, the piston then starts closing off the wastegate, you close off the wastegate, turbo speeds up. Bleed off the oil, the spring pressure starts pulling the, the uh, little butterfly valve open and you start slowing down the turbocharger. So as temperature, as the temperature of the air increases, the air is less dense, it's less dense, um, and because it's less dense, less dense, we'll say this, the bellows will expand. Will expand, blocking off, blocking off um, oil from waste, blocking off oil from, I should say draining, draining, blocking oil off, blocking off oil from draining. And we'll go with that from the wastegate. Um, so the wastegate will close. Your wastegate pressure will build. We'll build and wastegate closes more turbo there we go more turbo and the opposite is true um, as temperature decreases don't want to say that now I want to make this a seven And I'll go over here and we'll say as temperature, as temp, temp decreases, decreases. Well, as temperature decreases, then the density is going to increase. The air is better. So the engine is going to need less air. So we'll say that engine needs less air, so to speak. So bellows contracts, so bellows contracts and and bleeds off oil from wastegate. Bleeds off oil from wastegate. And of course, then the wastegate will open It'll open, um, which allows more exhaust gases to bypass, and we'll say less turbo, less turbo. Now I could do the same thing now with, with pressure. I'm not going to, but as temperature um, increases, well, we'll just talk about it while you're writing. So what happens as the pressure 
decreases. Well, as pressure decreases, we're going to be up here like with number six. So as temp increases, air is less dense. I could have wrote that the same thing. As pressure decreases, then the same thing is going to be true. The bellows will expand, blocking off oil from draining. Wastegate will build up and close and want more turbo. And then I could have said the same thing over here as temperature or as pressure increases. The engine needs less air, so the bellows contracts, bleeds off oil from the wastegate, the wastegate opens, you want less turbo. There's my boy, Eric. What's up, Eric? <laughs> you good? Caught oh. up? Okay. How's Janet doing today? My other pace car. She's probably not there. Okay, moving on. So everybody's got a clear and, and good concept of what the density controller does. Looking at faces, looking for thumbs up, claps, hands. All right. I'm just still a little confused. Like when you're talking about the bellows system, why, like with the density of air, how it increases and decreases it? Like why, why use a bellows? I'm just, I'm just kind of confused. I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you remember how the automatic mixture control works in a pressure carburetor? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. It's the same concept. Okay. So the, the bellows was used to measure the density of air. As density decreased, the bellows expanded. We used that expansion to drive a, a needle one way or the other. So it is with the density controller. We're using an, mm -hmm. uh, a bellows that expands and contracts. That so expansion and contraction drives a, a rod that opens and closes ports. So does density and pressure move the same way typically? Like as one increases, the other increases? Yeah, yeah. Except it's, it's uh, you have to uh, correct for temperature. So uh, as pilots, oh, Harry may have to help me out of this one. They always, uh, what is the, I know, I just freaked him out. So uh, pilots always say, well, uh, density altitude is uh, pressure altitude corrected for temperature. Did I say it right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, for non-standard temperature. Yep. For non thank you. So um, I'm trying to say it a way that I haven't said it yet. So you just have to remember, I could, I could always change the word density and just use the word pressure. And it would all mean the same thing. But when I say density, I'm including a temperature correction. So the whole bellows is, is checking pressure but if the air gets hot and the pressure is still there it will kind of know that and then correct for that okay makes a little more sense now no oh, hopefully i was running out of words there all right so let's talk about the next one then the differential pressure controller differential pressure controller All right, so uh, let's take a look at a picture of it so we can refresh your memory. So we're going to talk about the differential pressure controller or one side, the dark blue, is checking upper deck pressure and the other side, the green, is manifold pressure. And its job is going to be to sense the difference between these two. So eh, they could have put it right here, right in between this, and, but uh, it was easier to stick it over here and normally run one line. So some actually do put it right there. So. All right, differential pressure controller. Uh, one side of the bellows connects to upper deck. Oh, I said that, so I'll write it. So one side, one side connects, or one side of, I wanna say bellows. I should probably say diaphragm. I'll just put one side, it's really not a bellows there. One side connects to upper deck.
upper deck pressure, and the other side, other side, connects to manifold pressure. All right, so this, there's a spring in there. So spring pressure, spring pressure, spring pressure holds the valve, holds the valve in a normally closed, closed position. All right, so what does normally closed mean? So remember, normally closed is abbreviated NC, normally closed. So I can skip some things. And normally closed means, means oil pressure builds in the wastegate. Oil pressure builds in the wastegate. All right, so oil pressure builds in the wastegate. It's going to drive the piston uh, to, the, to the left in our drawing. It drives it to the left. That's going to close the wastegate. So that means we'll put it in parentheses so we can follow along. Turbo on. So the normal standard way of the differential controller is going to be more turbo. Turbo on. Uh, open the wastegate. Builds wastegate. Turbo on. Um, yeah, I can just leave it at that. That works. So then, then. MJ, the current time is for hours and 20 minutes. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin's in her. I think he has to go potty. So, uh, all right. So 420, we'll stop here and we shall come back.